you, Matthew. I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to help out the veterans projects. In fact, I'm always glad to help out any projects that help us remember our history because we will keep making the bad mistakes if we don't know what our history is and going forward. Uh, so my name is Deborah Mack and I live in Venice, Florida, right down the road from Punta Gorda. And I've lived in Venice. Well, I've been a resident of Venice, I'm going to say, for 40, God, 41 years now, since 1981, uh, when my family ended up moving here. Um, originally, though, I'm from a city right outside of San Francisco called Santa Rosa, but I grew up in San Francisco and I grew up in England. My heritage is my parents, starting with my father, uh, he served in the British Royal Navy and his ship, the HMS Orion, a linear class model, uh, was attacked off at Rodaki, Crete in 1941 and they limped basically because they were so severely damaged to Alexandria, then down to Cape Town and then across the bottom of the Pacific and up the east coast, west coast side of South America to San Francisco to Treasure Island for repairs because obviously with the war going on they couldn't go to England. Uh, the ship was there for approximately 10 months to be rebuilt to return to the war. Uh, during that time my father fell in love with San Francisco, the city by the bay, and he made the decision then that when he had the chance he was coming to America and he got a job there. He worked the 10 months in the auto industry. He was a mechanic by trade from England. He was a chief mechanics mate in the British Navy. The owner of the company that he worked for told him that when the war was over, he had a job to come back to because he was such a great employee, all around great guy. My father continued with the ship they were actually one of the first ships on the invasion of Normandy and his ship was also the first ship that was an ally that fired any of the salvos onto the beach. Um, war ended, he migrated from England to Canada with the Navy, made his way out in Seattle, bought his passage out, that's how the British Navy did it, and made it down to San Francisco in 1946 and became a citizen in 1948. And Next thing you know, the rest of the Gogan family started their way over. <laughs> anyway, I, w I, sh I showed up in 1959, uh, but we still had our English roots. And even though I did schooling in America, I also went to school in England, as did many of my cousins, because my father's brothers all immigrated over. And so I went to Goldsmith College, University of London, and got a degree in music theory which really didn't get me very far in life, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, and then I also have a degree from Columbia Southern in business administration because I was a finance director for the hospitals here in the area uh, before I made the decision to go into the Navy Reserves full-time back in 1990. Uh, prior to that, I had enlisted in the Navy in 1977 upon graduation of high school, but things just weren't kind of working out really good so I had my contract canceled and I went to college out in Hawaii and that's actually where I ended up meeting my husband. So sometimes things work out for the best. That's the way I look at it. Um, we got married. We did a lot of tours out in the Pacific. Probably one of the best kept secrets of the Navy was Pacific Missile Range Facility out on the island of Kauai and we enjoyed it. And then from there, we went to Rota, Spain. Our children were born in Spain. And uh, then I decided, it, even though I was a government employee all this time, um, I decided to go, I was gonna ready to go into the Navy Reserve. And so I did that. And my timing was probably one of the worst because I did it five days before the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq. And the next thing you know, I'm being mobilized. So it's been a, it's been a whirlwind ride <laughs> with the Navy and uh, my life with the Navy uh, for quite a few years now. So. Was your decision to join the military easy based off your family heritage? Yeah, it was pretty easy based off the family heritage. Um, and I think what made it even easier was the fact that 
when I decided to do it, we were actually stationed at Brunswick, Maine. Um, my, because I had a very supportive husband, well, he's since passed away. Um, it was very supportive. I wanted to do it. It was something that I'm one of these people that like when I start something, I like to finish it. And I, it was kind of like one of these nagging things in the back of my mind of, you know, I started this, I was almost there, I was almost done, and I didn't do it. And my husband, Don, at the time said, now's the time to do it. You know, he goes, I'm retiring in four years. Do it. I don't care. You know, he goes, I, you've supported me, I'm going to support you. So um, that's kind of how it ended up being. And I went to school, went to the, you know, I was obviously one of the older people to go through training at that point in my life, having kids. And I was older than my instructors, <laughs> but that was okay because they taught me what I needed to know. So how old were you when you enlisted? Uh, well, the first time I was 17, but then the second time I was 30. Yes, 30. I How just, old were your kids at the time? Um, my daughter was seven at the time and my son hadn't been born yet. Okay. My son showed up two years later. What was your daughter's reaction when you were going to go into the Navy? She thought it was cool. Cause she was like, she was actually used to up in Brunswick, a lot of the dual military people. So it didn't really phase my daughter at all. She thought it was really kind of neat. Um, she was just really kind of glad when she found out that dad was getting orders back to row to Spain cause she had been born there. We were going back to Spain. Um, all total, we ended up living in Rota for eight years. We really loved it. Great place, great, great community, very family oriented. Um, when we were, when we lived there, we didn't even have a telephone. You know, two two Spanish TV channels came on at three o'clock in the afternoon till midnight, all in Spanish. Um, you know, it was great. You got out, you did stuff. It was it was like living in America in the 40s and 50s, without all the electronics and the gadgets and the phones and TVs and VCRs and whatnot. I guess people don't even have VCRs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so walk me through your uh, first impression of training or basic training. Um, so what was it like going there, the lack of communication and what was your mindset when you walked through uh, the doors for the first time? I think my mindset was God, I hope they don't kill me, <laughs> you know? And then I was like, I'm going to make it through this. And it was like, I know that these people are here to take care of me. I think because of my long exposure with the military, having um, been a government service employee overseas and because of my husband, I knew that they were there to teach me no matter how hard it was and that we want people that are strong. We don't want weaklings being in our fleet. You know, if, if you're a weakling and we're at war, you're useless to us. You're not gonna help us. And in fact, you're gonna take down your whole division, your whole department. You could take down the ship, the squadron, whatever you're assigned to, whether it's land, sea, or air. So my feelings were probably because I was more mature at that time that I knew that they were there to do what needed to be done. So, I mean, I, I felt, I felt comfortable. I, I wasn't, I probably wasn't as scared and nervous as a lot of the younger people were. Cause like I said, I was probably one of the older people, but I got through it and I, obviously everything worked out. <laughs> Do you remember any of your instructors, any of your RDCs or officers or who were teaching you while you were, it was in Orlando? Yeah, I mean, I do remember them. Um, I can picture, you know, it's funny, it's like, you always remember your recruiter. And my recruiter in 1977 <laughs> was FCC John Kirk. And I remember my recruiter in 1990 was PN1 James Seabird. So them, them I remember, but when it, there was just like such a blur, I guess, of all of the different people coming in and out. I can picture them, but do I remember all of their names? No, 
But I remember the recruiter's names. <laughs> I remember the recruiter's names. Do you have any vivid memories of uh, basic training? Yeah, not not wanting to drown during the uh, shipboard evolution of, uh, <laughs> you know, rep pipe repairing, being flooded out, you're in water up to your shoulders. Well, that was me because I was 5'10", but you know, shorter people, it was already over their heads and they were treading water. Uh, trying to do pipe repairs with the flanges, you know, re remembering even in the freezing cold water with the flange, the wood chips, um, the, the rope, the twine, you know, to get it to hold so that you could stop the pipe burst. And then of course, once you got one stopped, another one started somewhere because that was the whole point of it, to put you under pressure and be nonstop. That one I probably remember the most because there was a lot of short people in the class. Would that be the hardest part of training or were there other times that seemed more difficult for other reasons? Um, I think some of the psychological training was tough, but you know, like I said, I, I guess because I had worked as a civil servant on Navy bases, I was, I was kind of used to some of the, and, and this was, and you also have to remember, this was back in the 70s and 80s. It was a different culture and a different time in our military than it is nowadays. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that was said and done to you that it's not done nowadays, let's put it that way. Um, so you kind of had a heart, you, you had tougher skin. And so what's acceptable back then is definitely not acceptable now. So I guess maybe my exposure to it made me easier to go up with the flow, I guess. Because even as a civil servant working overseas, you would have GS 11s, 12s, 14s yell at you. I don't want, I'm trying to be cautious on my words here. Um, you know, chew you out and things like that and just really belittle you in front of everybody. So it, it was, like I said, it was a different world. It was a different culture when I came, when I actually came in. Do you think that, um, so I know the culture can be different topic wise um, between like harassment and the way that things, like in the old Navy things were, um, but is that something different than what you experience as a woman? Um, at that time, women were always put down. I mean, there, there was just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, it you know, when I originally was first going to come into the Navy, you know, one of the things they said was, well, as soon as you're pregnant, you know, we don't even have maternity uniforms for females. I was like, oh, okay, well that wasn't on the schedule right now, but thank you for telling me that. I remember that from the recruiter. Um, you know, women were looked at like, okay, you're a yeoman, you're a personnelman, and that's it. And then those females that were doing harder jobs were looked upon as, okay, th there must be something wrong with them, they're different, leave them alone. But hey, you know what, they're really good at their job. For some reason, they really seem to know what they're doing because yeah. they had to prove themselves. And I'm gonna say that even myself, through until, probably until I made senior chief, I was always actually having to prove myself. You know, one of the things that I can actually remember proving myself happened um, with one of my commands and that was with SEAL Team 7 in 2009. So in 2008, I was still working at Fifth Fleet in Bahrain, and I was working the watch floor. I was um, a flight coordinator for our military aircraft going in and out of different countries due to OEF, OIF. Um, and I was always known as the patient senior mom, they used to call me as a senior chief in E8. Um, because nothing rattled me, they said. I always had patience. And I said, well, it's because I had teenagers, so, you know, I had good practice. And I had a situation in 2008 of a plane, um, a C-5, 
and it was to bring out um, operators from a country adjacent to Afghanistan. And the problem was is they got held up, they had issues going on, their equipment, their people they were working with was slowing them down, and we had a very small window to get them out of this country. And AMC back at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois is on the phone, they're emailing on Sipper. Uh, you know, the plane's gonna leave without them. I'm like, no, the plane can't leave. And I'm calling them and I've got a cell phone that's being used calling me saying, we're on our way, we're four hours out. The plane's supposed to leave in two hours. And I had to call Scott and I finally got the approval um, through the embassy to hold the plane. And about three or four days after that, I actually got asked over to Naval Special Warfare Group 3 in Bahrain, and it was the XO, and he wanted to thank me, as did several of the operators. And I was like, I was doing my job. And they were like, yeah, but they said, you know, if, if the plane had left without you getting your stuff done, we would have really been, you know, up a creek without the paddle, or two paddles, or three paddles. And so I, you know, I thanked them. They took me to lunch, great guys. You know, I knew some of them from the base. And about four months later, Dexo invited me to lunch again, which kind of surprised me. And um, he was like, we wanted you to consider, we have a new program in the Navy special warfare community called Women's Female Engagement Tribal Outreach. And um, we want to consider you for a nomination. There's going to be five of you. And I was like, wow. And I said, what do I have to do? And they were telling me, and I was just kind of like sitting there, um, running all this through my head going, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, I was honest. I was hardly even eating my lunch, just kind of like moving the food around with my fork. And I said, can I think about this? And they were like, yeah, you can think about it. And, um, but we'll, we need to know in about a month. And I'm like, okay, so I thought about it. But I can't, and they said, don't tell anybody. I'm like, great. <laughs> So I thought about it and thought about it and then finally I was like, you know what, if they feel confident enough and I was honest with them, I don't run. That's the other thing. I'm a swimmer. I don't run because I've had five knee surgeries by this time. And I told them, I said, I don't run and I don't climb rocks and, you know, I'm not a sniper even though I've got, you know, a couple of nice ribbons on my ribbon rack that say, you know, the military trusts me with a handgun and a long gun. And they said, we will train you. And I said, not that stuff you guys have out in Coronado. And he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, we have different training for what we call tech enablers. And I said, oh, okay. So I was like, okay. So I signed on, I did it, I went to training. I thought they were gonna kill me. Um, it was probably the worst six weeks of my life um, between the equivalent of SEER school, uh, Percent 2, Mystic, and some other trainings that the operators had out of Coronado. Um, as I said, I finished it. I survived it. From my neck down, I was the color of bruise. I learned to be a sharpshooter. I learned all sorts of things that I never would have imagined in my life I was gonna learn. And then I got to go on their projects. Um, because what they decided was Operators come in, kick down doors, shoot things, break things, blow up things, and then they want to ask villagers questions about where things are. And they thought, this isn't working. Why don't we try it the opposite way of maybe having females go in and talk to the females in the village, which the operators obviously couldn't talk to because they were men and it's part of the Muslim faith. You know, it's the culture. And so I actually was assigned, they found a female translator, and uh, I was assigned to SEAL Team 7, and this was in 2009. I call it my 233-day camping trip, or the fact they said, people always ask me, well, how many times did you go outside of the wire with them? And I said, just once, and then we came back 233 days later, <laughs> and they go, oh. I said, yeah, we built our campground, we built our compound, you know, twice a week a helo would come out, drop stuff off, and uh, it was kind of a cool thing. It, w it was really cool. Great guys. I trust them with my life. But I, w I went through um, initially first at the training because I was the only female in the class. Even though they said there would be five, I was the only one. 
and there were 17 other Navy uh, related people that were going to other locations. And uh, But I was the only female, I was the oldest person, I was 49 years old at the time. But I made it through the class and I had a target on my back because of course people didn't want this program, especially SEALs. You know, females, SEALs, no, we don't have that. That's not us. So I knew I had the target on the back. I knew I had to do what I had to do, and I made it. And then when I got to my debt after we flew to Iraq, um, I literally had to reprove myself again. But these seven guys were the guys that were gonna make certain I came home wa on walking on two feet. And they had to make certain that I had their backs, that they would come home walking also. And I knew that going in, and after about three weeks, they were like, okay, you know what you're doing. You listen, you, you understand who's the boss out here. And I said, yeah. And I said, and you understand what my job is out here. And they said, yes. And we got along, and, and we, we, had a lot of, we had a lot of serious talks. I told them, I said, I know you guys don't understand this program. I said, and I know you probably hate this program because it's part of the culture because women don't belong out here. And then a couple of them said, yeah, and you're older than our parents. And I went, oh, great. And I said, would your parents be out here doing this? And they were like, hell no, they can't even get off the couch to get the damn remote control off the table. I went, oh, so I've got a one up on your parents. And they go, yes. So uh, we did that and we did a lot of engagements and I did my job, they did their job. Sometimes I went with the State Department for meetings and engagements if they flew out or the Marines. Um, and then while we were out there, like I said, every day was, every day I was challenged, every day. And, uh, but the challenge paid off because we found a nomad and his son, who remember the, when then Lieutenant Commander Spiker's plane crashed in Operation Iraqi Freedom, way back. Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, he was the only aircraft and person we lost, and he's missing for, what, 19, 18 years? And these guys said, yeah, we remember the plane crashing. I was like 10, 11 years old in the desert. We went out and we, they went with us, and sure enough, um, rock formation, and one of our SEALs was actually a reservist. He was a chiropractor in his civilian life in San Diego and as carefully digging out this little rock pile, you could see bones and tattered material in there. And because we had a, who better than a chiropractor to have with you? Um, he just looked at it, he goes, yep. He rattled off like all the bones and you know the vertebrae and everything, and he's like, that's human. And so next thing you know, the Marines came out with their HET team and uh, exhumed everything. And, you know, we saw the remnants of the plane wreckage. It kind of looked like one of a Steven Spielberg uh, movies when they say, oh, we found planes in the middle of nowhere and there's, you know, seven feet of dirt piled up against the wheel wells and the fuselage and the tail fin is how it was. And uh, they exhumed them and then brought them back. And uh, one of the funny things was um, with my SEAL group, because they were all so young, None of them really knew the story about Spiker. The oldest SEAL had been like in third grade when the first Gulf War took place. And none of them were from Florida. So I explained why it was such a big deal to a Florida, me being a Floridian now, uh, Senator Bill Nelson. Florida Senator Bill Nelson says he's planning to take down the POW MIA flag he placed outside his office when Spiker went missing. For those children to be able uh, now to know and not have to continue to wonder is their father alive uh, is, is uh, the closure that they needed. So it was really interesting. The Marines though got their little two cents of fame because they had a satellite phone and they did an uplink right away. Hey, he's been found. Um, the Naval Special Warfare did put out the message um, that we did recover on July 26, 2009, the remains of Captain, now Captain Spiker because he had been uh, promoted, you know, post-humanlessly. I can't say that word properly. Um, so that was probably like my most challenging time in the Navy and probably my most rewarding time out of 30 years.
but um, so yeah when you ask me how much I was challenged that's probably the most challenging time because you never want to get shot with sim rounds to know what it feels like to be shot <laughs> So I got shot quite a few times in the training because they wanted you to, they wanted you to know what it's like to be shot. So made it through and here I sit. <laughs> Let's uh, go back in time and we'll go to the decision to join the Navy. Are you choosing the Navy because your father was a sailor as well? Yes. Or, okay. Yes, it was, an e it was a very easy choice um, to pick the Navy. Um, a, because my father had been in the Navy. And also, I guess because growing up in San Francisco, um, a lot of people don't realize it, but up until the early 1990s, San Francisco was a huge Navy town. I mean, we had Treasure Island, we had Concord, we had Naval Air Station o over in Oakland with the jets. We had aircraft carriers assigned there. We had Hunter's, Hunter's Point Shipyard. We had the Concord Naval Weapons Station. Um, we had Moffett Airfield. I mean, San Francisco, they hold Fleet Week still, but it's still, it was a big Navy town. So I think that was between my father and the fact everything was Navy. It was just a very easy decision. I never had any desire to join the Army or the Marines. Uh, the Air Force was like, eh, I, I kind of want to be more into the Navy's, like into everything, whether it's land, sea, or air. So that was pretty much why my decision was the first time and then the second time. <laughs> what was your first assignment um, once you complete your training? My first assignment was with, um, it's now, yeah, decommissioned obviously it was with AFDM-7, the USS Sustain out of Norfolk, Virginia. And it was a floating dry dock for our ships. And that was a really interesting thing because you never know when you went to work each day whether you had to like walk up what seemed like a hundred steps of a ladder to get to work or you just walk straight onto it from the pier whether it was full of water or not full of water. But you know, there was always that thing of you had to walk forever to get across the damn parking lot because Norfolk is, you know, the mother load of sailors of America. <laughs> and everybody walks forever to get to their ship wherever it's located at. So that was the first one was the USS Sustain. And then your duties when working there, um, primarily just logistics supply. Yeah, I was a store, I was a store, what was then a storekeeper, an SK, which has now been transitioned to an LS, logistics specialist. I was a storekeeper. I worked on parts for ships repair for their AMOL, um, working with the AIMD uh, portion of it for whatever ship was in the dry dock to make certain that we had all the parts, whether it was a little screw or a flange or a big chunk of metal, whatever it was they needed. That's what our jobs was. We, we ordered the parts, we did that. We received them, we did the inventory, we issued them out, we were in charge of the storerooms, um, things like that. How long were you on the... That was the... two years. Okay. For did two. you um, advance while you were no. uh, serving? No, I was, I, well, I, I, I reported as a third class and I departed as a third class. At the, that time, um, unbeknownst to me, because the recruiters never tell you these things when you're an enlisted, oh, you're going into an overmanned rate. So you're going to take the advancement exam twice a year and you're going to get a score of 9999, which means you ace the test, but sorry, we have no opening. So uh, yeah, I, I, I remain the same. And ironically, when I had been in civil service with the Navy as a civilian, I worked in logistic supply. So everything I did as a storekeeper was secondhand nature to me as a civilian, as a GS. Where'd you go after that? We went back to Rota, Spain. My husband was uh, re-signed back to Rota, Spain. We had done six years there in the 80s. Um, he had the choice of going to back to VQ2 in Rota, Spain or VQ1 in Guam. And we decided to go back to Spain because 
A, I was now pregnant with our second child, and B, the fact we loved the area. We loved Europe. It was an easy two-hour flight to England from Spain. I could go see family all the time because I still had a lot of family in England. Um, we knew people there. I knew I could go back to work. Um, there was always plenty of SK jobs available, let's put it that way. <laughs> Were you inactive when you got I back? Was, I, was, I was a reservist when we went back to Spain and I, went, I ended up being a GS again and I was an activated reservist there. So okay. I started as one job, ended as another job. And then we left Spain in 1994 due to the Clinton drawdown of the military. And my husband got caught up in that, as did thousands of other people. So our three-year tour got abbreviated to two years. And then we didn't quite know where we were going to go, so we came home to Venice. Uh, my husband is from New York originally, <laughs> my late husband, I have to say. Um, he was from the upstate New York, Rochester, and he really had no desire to ever go back there. High cost of living, taxes, things like that. And he had actually changed his state of residency to Florida many years earlier. So we came here and the folks were actually on vacation. So we lived in their home for about three or four months until we figured out where we were going to live, got the kids in school. And I went back to work as a civilian for a couple of years because we were now, as I call it, in between wars. We were done with the Gulf War. We hadn't really started everything in Bosnia, Yugoslavia. <laughs> yeah. I felt like we were like always in between wars. So I went to work uh, at the hospital up in Sarasota. I was their finance director for material support. And I did that for a couple of years. And then the next thing you know, my unit that I was assigned to was ComUS NavSent out of Bahrain and Tampa. They had a forward and a re rear uh, commands. Three star was out in Bahrain, the one star was back here in Tampa. And that was my reserve unit. And the next thing I know, we were activated and pretty much I ended up being a full-time reservist. What year is this? Um, started in 96 when we were doing Operations Southern and Northern Watch uh, for Iraq. And um, that's how I ended up going out to 5th Fleet. And it was kind of amazing because I was an SK-2 at the time. I was the only SK-2 and I was the only SK in the, in the command at the time in the rear echelon. And I was like, why are we doing this, you know? And we'd go out there and they're like, oh, you have to learn this, this, this on the watch floor. And I, I mean, the first time I walked in there, I was like, I feel like I'm in a Tom Clancy movie with all the screen. I mean, I was, I was just mind blown. You know, I was mind blown. I was like, wow, this is like being in the movies, you know, but this is the job. And you know, they taught me and I was like, I'm an SK. I'm not a CT. I'm not an IS. They said, doesn't matter. You're assigned to our command. This is your job. I'm like, okay. So I learned it and uh, got to started, got to go to a lot of really cool places for like over 20 years. Um, I mean, I went to Egypt several times. I did Bright Star. Um, from Bright Star, I went out to ships. Um, I worked with the, the coalition and our allies on different operations, mission support. Got to see all of the different countries pretty much in Fifth Fleet. And when uh, Fifth Fleet controlled part of East Africa, so that was kind of neat too. And then uh, the next thing I know, uh, the Twin Towers went up and uh, I really never came home. So, uh, and I ended up making chief right after that and um, kept on going. And every time there was a different opportunity out in that region, I took it because I was like, I'm never gonna get these opportunities again in life part of my adventurous. And I even brought my kids out. I mean, they loved it. My kids would come out. Uh, my son, the first time he went to Bahrain, he was nine years old. He's now 29. He came to Bahrain four times as a dependent, and he's been to Bahrain two times stationed with the Navy. And each time he would, the first time he came out to the Navy, with the Navy to be stationed there, you know, they were, everything's all about, well, here's your check-in sheet. We got to show you where everything is, this and that. And he says, 
I borrowed my mom's car and I'm parked out here and they're like, you what? And they go, yeah, he goes, I've been here four times before as a kid. He goes, I saw this base being built. He goes, this is where I, I can, you know, know where everything is. And they were like, we love you because then somebody didn't have to give up their week of check-in and in dock and, you know, he knew where everything was on base and off base. So yeah. Um, and then the same with my daughter. She came out, um, she's in the Air Force. We still love her though. And, <laughs> but she was born in the Navy on a Navy base. So that's why we really love her. And she's a Lieutenant Colonel now. She works at NGA up in Fort Belvoir. And um, she was looking for a job with the Air Force and she needed to get some practice with drones. And she actually was able to finagle because I guess it was the Air Force. Um, an unpaid TDY trip to Bahrain while I was out there and I got her in and she got to watch uh, drone training because she was trying to um, get a job. I believe she was like an O2 at the time um, to go to some command, but she needed, she needed some hands-on training and she knew it would help her in her interview. So mom helped out and I said, you can stay with me for free. And that's how she ended up getting her job and she's an in intelligence. So she's really a good kid. And uh, like I said, both of my kids, I never, never encouraged, never pushed them to join the military, and they both made their decisions on their own. Their father didn't encourage them, didn't push them, and we both happily sat at their graduations. So, anyway. What, um, going back to around 96, when you first go back, uh, when you first go to the Middle East, what are those tasks that they're, out of your rate that they're having you actually work on? Out of my rate was working on a watch floor, which on, um, I don't know if I can, am I allowed to say, well, we have different computer systems. We have about five different computer server systems in the military and the high ranking civilians for the Pentagon. And it was, I had to understand and I think that's the best way to describe it is I had to understand first what the end result was of working on a watch floor. You know, it's not just here sitting in front of a computer and you're logging this and this and this when you see something happen. It's like something's happening, but we need to know what the end result's going to be. And we got to gather information in the middle and we're doing all the watching. And this is the area we need you to watch on the screens, or this is what we need you to understand and translate of messages coming in of information coming in from different sources and i was like oh okay and then what happens to it and i kept asking questions and i and i people will always say i'm known as the person that always sat in the front row for any training and always had her hand up always asking questions and I said, if I don't understand this and I don't know the answer, I am useless to the cause. And I have really reiterated that over my years as a senior enlisted person to junior people saying, never feel embarrassed to be the one to raise your hand and continually ask questions. Because if you don't understand it, more than likely other people sitting in the audience don't understand it either. And this is war. This is people's lives. Yeah. You know, equipment is replaceable, but people's lives aren't. And we're now responsible for groups of people and we want to make certain that they come home safely to their family. So um, that was the hard part was understanding what we were doing. Uh, I mean, cause I didn't know I'm a storekeeper. Yeah. <laughs> I order widgets. I, I, I issue out oddball things that, you know, fix things and make things go. But now I'm, now I'm part of a totally different, uh, area of the military, not just the Navy, but the military, because Fifth Fleet is a joint command. When you're in Bahrain mm -hmm. at this time, so they've been an ally with the United States for quite a while, and this is the late 90s, so mm -hmm. what is the climate like there with the people and the way they interact with other military members? And I know there's a lot of other um, countries there too that have right. their military representing but I'm just curious what what that was like in the late 90s before 9-11 happens. So in the late nine in the mid to late 90s the Bahrainis wanted the military there we were at that time we were a very small footprint in that country prior to um, 
nine, um, the Gulf War, the Fifth Fleet was actually stationed out of Hawaii. A lot of people don't realize this in the 80s. The Fifth Fleet headquarters was actually based out of Hawaii with a forward component on a ship called the USS LaSalle uh, in the Persian Gulf with leadership on board, but they answered back to Fifth Fleet in Hawaii. And then after Gulf War, everything was moved forward to Bahrain on the land, a very small footprint. And back here at CENTCOM in Tampa, COM US Nav Cent Rear was in place. So we had a one-star admiral at COM US Nav Cent based out of Tampa, and we had a three-star on the ground with staff in Bahrain. Ironically, there was only about 100 to 150 people in Bahrain, but back here in Tampa, we had a couple hundred people because that's just the way it was set up. So for the people in Bahrain, the actual citizens there, um, they appreciated the Fifth Fleet and NSA Bahrain. At that time, it used to be called ASU Bahrain, Auxiliary Support Unit Bahrain, not Naval Support Activity Bahrain. Um, they were glad that we were there because during the first Gulf War, there had actually been a couple of the Scud missiles had landed in Bahrain. So they knew that they were in striking distance from Saddam Hussein's Iraq. We also know that we're roughly 124 to 127 miles from the east coast of Bahrain to the west coast of Iran. So. They're like in striking distance, so they appreciated the military, not just the Navy, but the military in general being there. They felt like they had security support. They were very friendly. Uh, the Dodge School had been in place for quite a few years. Uh, people on the base when we were off duty, obviously we everybody lived off base. We frequented their stores, their cinemas. Um, different things that were available. We learned about the different culture and things like that. I mean, obviously there's a lot of things Americans and Europeans and Westerners do that are foreign and no-nos to people of the Muslim faith. Um, but that, you know, we were told that we have to be very cautious of that. You know, I mean, alcohol, pornography, um, single females being pregnant. Oh my gosh, that's like the biggest no-no. I mean, like as soon as a female who's not married might even think she's pregnant, the Navy would have her shipped out because it's considered illegal, it's against the law. You would literally be arrested and put in jail, the child's born and then the child's put up for adoption. So yeah, so it's a totally different climate, different culture out there, but you learn to adapt and I actually learned to adapt to it. I enjoyed it. I mean, there was just so much to do, so much to learn. I mean, I'm, I'm Roman Catholic by birth and my family, but I think I'm a very open-minded Christian person, and I'm always willing to accept the fact that there's multiple religions in the world, uh, whether it's Buddhism, Judaism, Muslim, you know, whatever. I mean, look at our own country has many different faiths. So, I mean, it was really good. I mean, I learned a lot. I enjoyed going to the mosques. I learned a lot about the Muslim religion. Um, it's a very calming religion, but unfortunately, just due to the news and the jihadists, people think of them as everyone is a terrorist and a killer, and they're really not. So that's really, you know, one of the things that I always wanted to take away from 20 plus years in the Middle East is that it's, it's a very, very friendly, very accommodating, very welcoming religion. And when you're stationed um, with your command from Tampa, is your time just split between going to Bahrain for a certain number of time, coming back, or are you stationed there for like full, like? Well, it was years? originally, originally what I was told, <laughs> you know, there's always what you're told and the reality of what happens was we would spend a short amount of time forward in Bahrain and the majority of our time in Tampa. It became the opposite. I mean, I could probably say my time in Tampa is like all together is like less than like three or four months and my time forward in Bahrain and the other countries, whether Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Saudi, Oman, Muscat, you know, is 
years <laughs> and years, basically. Okay. So I guess we'll we'll go through all those different um, locations that you've been stationed at um, after Bahrain. And so from where, where do you go from there? Well, from Bahrain, even being assigned to Fifth Fleet, you would be assigned to different commands out of there. Um, as of last count, when I left there, when I left Bahrain in 2018, there were 83 tenant commands assigned to Fifth Fleet. So that's a lot. And that doesn't count the ships that come in under their own um, CDS 50, 55, 28, 7, whatever um, CDS number comes in to serve their six to eight month deployments. So there's a lot of different commands. And I, and I worked my way and was assigned to quite a few different ones. Um, I worked, like I said, watch floor a lot. I worked air support, which was actually a lot of fun, even though I ended up working a lot of nights, but I didn't mind that because it kind of put me on the same time zone as the East Coast for when I could, you know, call. And at that time we were like, oh my God, it's Skype. Everybody was like excited about Skype. You know, that was like the new great thing. So you could see your family back home. Uh, so I, I did four years. I worked in uh, air flight planning with what was called the logistics response cell. We also did small voice ship replenishments as well, up to like Kuwait, uh, down to UAE. That was uh, not very many, but we did some of those, but it was mainly aircraft. Um, I spent two years with C Commander Destroyer Squadron 50 at sea. So I was on 26 different ships. Uh, I never got my ESWAS pin because I have like 20 different PQSs from 20 different ships, so <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. TAD assigned to them? Yeah, every every CDS uh, 50, every time we would come in, we would be on a different platform, you know, and the whole squadron would go out. There was only like 15 of us under the Commodore, which was kind of cool, because we were the people wearing the, the desert camo and we'd be on the ships when everybody's wearing your basic coveralls and dungarees. So we stood out like a thorn. <laughs> What was shipboard life like when, um, I don't, I'm not sure how integrated and co-ed it was. Well, we worked in the CIC, the Combat Information Center. That's where we were mainly assigned to. And we would be flown onto the ships. And the very first time I had to take a helo onto a ship, and I remember looking out and it was what was called the Desert Duck Flights out of Bahrain and every, hydraulic line is leaking and you're getting saturated and I was like scared to death and everybody was like don't worry about it it's fine as long as the hydraulics are leaking the helo's in great shape and I'm like oh okay great <laughs> you know and the first time you land on a on a on that little dot on a and it was the cruiser Monterey actually I still remember that you're like oh my god I can't believe we're landing on that thing I mean you get there and I was like thank god we've landed um, and then you're integrated into um, the CIC of the ship and the Commander Destroyer Squadron, Commodore, is in charge of the ships that answer to the aircraft carrier out there. So um, that was also another thing I asked a ton of questions because I was like, what are we doing? What am I, you've got to explain to me. Remember, I'm the storekeeper here. And I will never forget the command senior officer, Commander Mike Lee, who had a very type A personality <laughs> and the Commodore just kept looking at me and he and he told me on my check and he goes I really appreciate reservists he goes you guys are awesome you were we couldn't have done what we did in the first Gulf War without you and of course once again I'm the only female out of 15 people and um, the Commodore during the briefing he he said he goes um, Mac how are you doing and I said getting it and he goes you're taking it all in and I go I just looked at him I said come here I said I'm saturated right now <laughs> I'm soaked in and he was like do you remember it all I go half of it and then there was a question about sightings and plottings and now I hadn't been involved in in charts and plottings the basic stuff they teach you at RTC and quite a few years because I'm a storekeeper I don't have a need I'm not an OS an operational specialist and the Commodore made a question to me about a plotting and a land thing 
and he says, you know, you live off the coast of Florida in Venice because apparently the Commodore knew where Venice was, <laughs> turned out. And he made a comment to me and he says, so what do you think we are as far as from land, you know, the land to the ship or something? He made some question to me and I said, sir, I said, when we go out on the boat in Florida, I don't even leave sight of land. And the next thing I know, the CSO took me outside and was chewing me up one side to the down the other and said, I cannot believe you made a comment like that to the Commodore. And I said, I was being honest. I said, I was being dead honest with him. Lives depend on this. And I said, I am not at a point right now that I feel comfortable doing readings and plottings. I said, I've been with you guys for like three weeks now. <laughs> and he was like, I'm going to be watching you. Go back into CIC, the Commodore makes a comment out loud. Now the CSO, I watched his face turn red. He goes, I want to thank Mac for being the most honest person in this room. And he goes, there's other reservists here in this room. He goes, I told you I appreciate you guys. But he goes, she was honest. And he goes, who else in here feels the same as she did? And like slowly four other hands went up. <laughs> so, but then I figured it out. I remembered the plotting and uh, made it through that two-year tour. <laughs> um, then, do, you, do you advance during this time? Yeah, well, I had, I had just also, I had just picked up chief. That was the other thing. Oh, so, okay. of course, the CSO felt like, you know, I'm the chief. I know everything. I, 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 why am I asking these stupid questions? I'm like, because I haven't been working in this. I haven't been at sea for like eight, nine nine years at that point yeah like nine years i'm like you don't remember everything <laughs> so but then we made it through it and we made it through oif and oef and then i went to my four years in logistic support of aircraft movements throughout the middle east and i flew to i had to do test flights to the different things to make certain all the stations far-flung little places worked and I went to, you know, whether it was Balad, whether it was Iraq, whether it was Can Afghanistan, you know, wherever we went, down to Djibouti, all over the place. So, and then, uh, let's see, we're up to about 2008 now. Oh, and that's when I did the aircraft movement with the SEALs and got their plane held. And then the next thing I know, I spent most of 2009 and 2010 with SEAL Team 7 out in uh, Coronado and then in Iraq and uh, we did that. And uh, You're a chief by then, right? I was a senior chief by then. When did you, what year did you um, pick up chief? Uh, chief was fiscal year 02 and then senior chief was fiscal year 05. I picked up senior chief right away. I picked up chief the first time out and I picked First class chief and senior chief, I all picked up the first time around. Okay. And then uh, I thought I was like all done and I was going to go back to being just a regular reservist. You know, that thing they advertise one weekend a month, two weekends a year in 2010, the end of 2010. Because I was really mentally, physically worn out from my SEAL team time. Um, really worn out. Um, I'd been in a helo mishap, I'd been in a rollover, um, I'd been in a couple of rocket attacks, uh, we got shot at, uh, you know, I earned my combat action ribbon. Um, I, I, I was like, okay, I'm like 50 years old now. I'm like, time to go home. And That, that all happened during yeah, the, your time well, with the SEALs? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I also had a lot of injuries that I, I learned something in war, in combat, that you get injured, but you don't realize you're injured until way later. And actually, that's where I'm at now at this point in my life. Um, you, you know, you're, you're so focused on getting through the mission, and you do a lot of missions. You know, you might do five missions a week, you might do one mission a week. You don't know. It, it depends upon the information and the data that's gathered as to how often you're going out, what you're doing, where you're going, the engagements, the tribal outreach. We're doing, I did a lot of stuff with the SEALs um, under the guise of humanitarian aid, um, like money for rebuilding schools and school supplies and 
trying to work to get the females to open up to me at all the nomad villages. And one of the things I did was I wrote to a friend in Rhoda and, I, and from the Navy Marine Corps relief shop, they sent me boxes of infants and children clothes and shoes and stuff, because these people don't have that. And with that, I was like, all these women were like, couldn't believe I was giving them all these children clothes. I was actually thinking of their children and they would open up with information that they had heard their husbands or their men or their fathers talk about. So that's how we got that. Um, I made an arrangement with um, a person named Melissa from the Croc Company. They sent me three pallets of Croc shoes. <laughs> As of now, there's probably thousands of people running around Anbar province wearing croc shoes and sandals, but they worked because, you know, it showed that we were getting, um, we were taking care of the children and we were taking care of the families. Uh, NSW brought out a veterinarian. They found a female veterinarian who came out and looked at their crops. And then the next thing I know, I was being sent pallets of grain and salt feed, feed salt, salt feed that animals use. I don't know, I'm not, I, I never took agriculture. I grew up in a city, you know. I was getting all these bags and pallets of stuff and you know, the operators were like, well, this is good for our workout because I couldn't even, they were 75 pound bags. I couldn't even pick one up. You know, they'd pick two up like they were nothing. And uh, you know, I'd get stuff like that and school supplies and we would get information. Um, so yeah, that was when, uh, but like I said, there was a lot of times that we did stuff that, you know, things happen. You know, I, you see the green tracers of the rocket attack, you know, you, you, lie, you suddenly you hear a whistle, you go flat on the ground, even though you don't, you're nowhere near your weapons in our little campground. Or like if I was on my tours of trips to Afghanistan, Iraq, things like that, to check out flights. Um, one time as a, as a master chief, we did a, we did a group of master chiefs. We went to a lot of bases throughout the area because a group in Washington donated Christmas trees. And so we took them and, but we had to load up and it was just like going on missions. And what <laughs> we're like, great. We're in truckloads with live Christmas trees from Washington state. God, we hope people don't think these are like, you know, weapons or containers of Doritos because Doritos and potato chips were a big deal to hijack up there. <laughs> it was a different life, different life that yeah. I never ever would have expected. And then, like I said, I thought I was going to be done and uh, April 1st, 2011, Chief's birthday, by the way, always got to remember that, not just April Fool's Day. Um, my orders took me back to 5th Fleet and I was in charge. What was supposed to be for three months became almost four years. Uh, the ERSS, Expeditionary Resuscitative Surgical Systems, which is I was in charge of nine person surgical team and 22 Pelican cases of a surgical suite that we went from ship to ship. And every six months I got a new surgical team and it was for an operation um, an operation that was done by the Beltway that um, we had to have a surgical team in place in case an allied country uh, needed immediate medical assistance. And so my three month job became almost four years until the end of 2014. And it was a lot of fun, it was challenging. And uh, Went on a lot of ships again, I can tell you that much. <laughs> Whether rib boat, Osprey, Hilo, pier side, um, I learned a lot about the medical side of life. Um, I knew supply side of medical, having been in material support, but I didn't understand the surgical side. And uh, But met a lot of great people, a lot of great people on my surgical teams. We had fun, we did our mission, uh, we helped other coalition countries out when we could, if the fleet would allow it. Um, part of the job was the fact that I, I had to make the call with Fifth Fleet. I could not let a captain or a commander surgeon crack open our surgical suite if a sailor or somebody was injured, if what was needed was right on the ship, because we had to keep the surgical suite ready to go for what the initial original mission is for. But we were really good. We helped out ships a lot. 
My team helped out DDGs when two, two different times their IDC, Independent Duty Corpsman, is on a destroyer. You don't have doctors, you have mm -hmm. an Independent Duty Corpsman. Um, one time they had to go home for an emergency leave, another time they had a medical emergency themselves. We were able to fill in. Um, I sent my surgeon one time to the carrier because the surgeon on the carrier had to go home on emergency leave. And I learned something that not many people know, that on an aircraft carrier, the highest ranking brass can be gone from the bridge, but no flight operations can take place if there's not a surgeon on board an aircraft carrier. I was floored when I learned that one. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, that's something new to add to my toolbox. <laughs> so we did that. We helped out the aircraft carrier with our surgeon. We sent the surgeon over, kind of left us in a bind for about three weeks so they could get a new surgeon out from Portsmouth. But, you know, you do what you got to do to help out the mission. From there, I went to Djibouti, CJTF HOA as the Navy Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Command Master Chief. Um, and that was an interesting job because not only was I responsible for roughly 200 sailors at CJTF HOA in nine different countries, I also had to deal with the Army. Sorry, Army, but we do have a better football team. Uh, <laughs> I had to deal with the Army because it was a joint command, so our front office was heavy from 06 to two stars with Navy, Army, and Air Force, and they all had to work together <clears throat> to do the mission, and it was a very unique job for 13 months because I got extended because my replacement didn't show up. Is that mission um, <clears throat> 2014, is it... Are you supporting? We're supporting the war on terror and yes, freedom. we're supporting the war on terrorism. That's mainly now in East Africa. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. I have an allergy to dust. Gee, I don't know how that ever happened with twenty plus years exposure to dust. Um, so sometimes my lungs get compromised. So our job at CJTF HOA was to support the war on terrorism in East Africa, um, like Boko Haram. Yeah, as one of them, you have down in Somalia, you have like multiple different groups of terrorists. We have bases in Kenya, we have bases in Somalia. We do a lot of the FID training, which is foreign. Uh, FID is foreign inter international defense training of different countries, and they would a lot of them would come to Djibouti. I'm to the base there, or we would send our people out to the foreign countries. Um, and we would have forward operating bases out there in the different countries. And they would be comprised of Army, Navy, Marine, Air Force, things like that. But because I was over the Navy people at CJTF HOA, besides remaining at headquarters, I would also go out to the forward operating bases to see how things were going. Whether they were CBs building something for a foreign country, whether they were special operators, whether they were IT people at embassies. We had Navy people at all our embassies as attaches. Um, it, it was interesting. Uh, we were also one of the, once again, I learned something new in my life. <laughs> um, we, had, uh, we operated fuel farms at outlying bases. And our aviation bosun's fuel person was stationed at headquarters. I never understood why we didn't have one of the one of this rate persons at all the outlying bases. We only had one at headquarters. We were only allotted one. And so under the rules of travel, you have to go in pairs. And so it kind of became, I went to all the fuel bases because I had to do travel anyway. The fuel guys had to do travel. So what was the point of doing two separate trips when we could make it one trip? <laughs> And then, of course, he's like, no, I need, and he was from the Bronx, New York, a diehard New York Yankee fan. God, I swear he bled blue. But anyway, he was like, the very first time, he was like, well, Master Chief, you got to help me with this and this. And I'm like, with what and what, you know? I learned all about fuel bladders, fuel refueling, testing of, a, taking test samples, things like that. And I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. 
And of course, Murphy's Law prevails. Like six months later, the guy had to go on emergency leave. And guess who has to now go out, take fuel samples, bring them back. And I'm like, this is my job. And they were like, but you're the only one that seems to know what it is because you went on all the fuel farm site trips. I go, yeah, I went because I went to go see my sailors, but you also helped. I said, got it. So I I took somebody else with me. I took, a, I took an LS with me and he was like, you're kidding. And I go, nope, you're going traveling. <laughs> so like I said, one of the things, the best things that I can say about the military is you always have to be open to learn new things. <laughs> And so I finished that, and then the next thing I know, I was back at Fifth Fleet, doing once again a new job of husbanding contracting, following the Fat Leonard's scandal fallout in the Pacific. Uh, Fifth Fleet took up Fifth and Sixth Fleet, I should say, out of Naples. Uh, re totally revamped their whole husbanding contract servicing for US and USNS ships uh, in Port Fifth Fleet. I went through the training, and for the next two years, I went to all the different ports in Fifth Fleet uh, for our port visits. I managed contracts anywhere from 200,000 to $2 million, especially for the air, aircraft carriers. They're the expensive ones. Um, at all the different ports, anywhere from Duke of Oman to Alexandria, Egypt, to the side of Saudi Arabia, Jeddah. Ugh. Uh, Karachi, Pakistan, all over the place we went. Anywhere there was a ship could pull in, one of us in our office was there. And uh, that was different. And then did that till the end of 2018. And then I went to CTF 75 as what was to be my twilight tour for retirement out in Guam. And I was like, yay, <laughs> tropical paradise. Probably one of the next best kept secrets of the Navy. I was in charge of probably the best group of reservists anybody could have had. Loved it out there for majority of uh, the end of 2018, then to 2019. Uh, then unfortunately, a um, uh, family member of mine, uh, my kid's father, uh, came down with stage four cancer. Um, he was a Navy veteran, retired after 20 years. He worked at the post office in Venice for 24 years. And I was um, kind of bouncing back and forth from Guam and Venice. And then in January of 2020, uh, COVID started and he really took a turn for the worse. And I was really afraid that I would be stuck in Guam. You know, I was, you know, the world kind of came to an end and I have to admit it, we were looking at the Asia side of the world, like, oh, you guys stay over there. We don't want your planes coming here. So I made the decision to come back and I retired in 2020. And uh, I have to admit it was probably the better decision because he did pass away in March of 2020. I also, uh, since 2020, um, because my name has been so well known throughout the fleets. Um, I've become kind of like the mentor still via Zoom. I get on so many Zoom meetings, it's not even funny. And I keep going, you know, I don't get paid for this. But they're like, yeah, but you give really good advice. So I've become a mentor uh, while I was dealing with funeral stuff, my VA stuff, my seven months to get my retirement from January to July. Uh, taken care of but you know things were the way they were nobody worked in an office you know you had to be patient that's all I can say you had to be patient and then I started getting text messages and I'd get Facebook requests and I'd get emails and phone calls because I've had the same cell phone number since like 1992 I think for my kids sake it was a very easy phone number so people remembered it and um, then the next thing I know, I was on a board with a lot of people out of Newport um, because we're trying to beef up the number of female command senior chiefs and command master chiefs in the Navy because there's roughly 600 command master chiefs at any one time. And out of that, there's like 18 <laughs> females. So the numbers are very skewed and we really needed to start beefing up the females. So. I was like, okay, it's a Zoom thing. My 
laptop at home, you know, just like everybody else, everybody's on Zoom working, you know, different groups trying to come up with strategies. And then I got involved with the VA because um, I was working my VA claim and unfortunately my VSO, my VSO, literally I walked in the office, he handed me the paperwork and says, I'm out of here in 13 days or something like that. So I figured out because I can be pretty admin astute um, how to do it and I uh, got my VA stuff done, processed, submitted and you know, everybody said, oh, don't expect much the first time. And I said, well, I think I'm kind of banged up. And uh, the first time I submitted, it came back at 90%. And I was like, wow, I guess I did something right. But then I, then I got my disc after my uh, Freedom of Information Request Act, and I read through it. And I was like, wow, I submitted for 22 items, and they threw aside basically 10 or 12 of them because they were all combat related, I guess because I thought it wasn't possible I could have had these injuries. And so I resubmitted, found a new VSO, and then I went through the VSO course, 16 weeks online, and it came back 100%. And I was like, oh, okay, this is how we do it. So now I get people contacting me, and I don't mind it. I don't mind being a mentor. I want to help people. If there's questions, you know, I still feel if there's questions to be asked, people want answers. and when I used to work in medical at a time, because I took on understanding Medicare and health insurance, um, it's like a foreign language. And I, and I feel the same way with the Navy, with the VA, with anything, is that if you don't understand something, ask. And maybe we just need to, the instructor, the facilitator, just needs to reword it. Because God forbid we send a soldier, a sailor, an airman, a space guardian, <laughs> a marine, out to war, and they don't understand what the mission is. They don't understand what they're supposed to do because it just wasn't worded right. You know, I mean, everybody's been in that high school or that college class, and you sit there for two hours, and you don't really understand what the professor, or the instructor, or the teacher was telling you, and then somebody sitting three rows over, you ask them, and they tell you something in a synopsis of four sentences, and you go, oh, that's what it was. You know, it's it's a foreign language. Everything's a foreign language in life, is the way I look at it. Such a fascinating career, very interesting. Um, unusual, especially for your rate. Yeah. It's totally very unique and amazing that you've had so many opportunities like that but then again unfortunate with some of the results that you've had even though you it's it's a good thing that you are 100 percent disabled because of the benefits however it means that you are 100 percent disabled so there are negatives to that as well i um i have some just like general questions sure. um what was it like when you found out that you we're going to put on chief. Oh my God. What was that feeling? I, I still remember. I was actually, um, <laughs> I was actually doing a load of laundry in Bahrain in my flat and I, and the phone was ringing and it was the house line, not the cell phone. And, um, I was like, yeah, damn, you know, I got like, the flat was really big. It was a big as a house really. And it was like, by the time I got to the phone, it had stopped ringing. And then the next thing I know, my cell phone rang, which was like back sitting with the laundry. So I'm like running back to where my washer and dryer is. I get it just in time. And it's Tampa because I'm, this is back in the days that we still have nav sent rear and nav sent forward. So it was Tampa calling me because it was like eight o'clock at night in Bahrain. So it's like one o'clock in the afternoon. and. Millington always releases those wonderful promotion messages at 1300 their time and they're like congratulations but you know I was like god this is the captain 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 I'm like I recognize the voice I know he's a captain what's his you know I'm thinking they're going what's his name you know he's like congratulations chief I'm like what are you talking about and he goes your name's on the list I go my name's on the what and he goes you made chief and I'm like I made chief, you know, and I'm like, 
He goes, what are you gonna do? And all I said was, I'm gonna finish putting my wash in the dryer. <laughs> and he started laughing. I remember that. I was like, oh my God, I made chief. You know, so, you know, then everybody in the office gets on the phone and congratulated me. And then they hung up and there I was finishing putting my laundry in the dryer all by myself. And I'm like, who do I call here? You know, and it was like, oh my God. It was like, so I called one of my best friend who is also from the unit in Tampa who was out there. And I, and I was, I called him on his cell phone and I go, sir. And he's like, yeah, what's up SK1? And I go, I just found out I'm a chief. And I go, I don't know who to tell out here. So I'm calling you. <laughs> and he's like, and I'm like, I, I, I I, I don't know who else is calling. He was like, this is like awesome. Like he was like the most senior um, officer in the unit out forward. And I, was, and I was like, he was like, that's great. And I could hear all these cars. I'm like, where are you? And he goes, oh, I'm actually walking on the road over to some friend's house over here in Adelaide. And I go, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, great news. So, you know, it was like, and then I hung up from him. And then I was like, who do I call? Oh, I'll call the watch floor. I call the watch floor and they're like, no, we haven't seen the message, you know? And I'm like, great. I'm like, now they're going to think I'm lying. Yeah. <laughs> but then like an hour later, they called me back. Congratulations and all. But yeah, it was like, I just, I was like, couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. Because I was like, I didn't think that I was going to make it. It was too, I was too soon. Yeah. It was too soon. <laughs> You know, I was like, wow. I was like, I just couldn't believe it. And then the Commodore called me and I was like, Jesus, everybody. And I was like, and then the next thing I know, I was back on a Hilo cause I was in, in Bahrain at the time, but I'm attached to Desron 50. So we're back out on the ship. And the next thing I know, it was like two mornings later, it was like 4 a.m. in the morning. I was out with the Chief Selects on the USS Monterey, the only female on the ship once again. <laughs> God, this once again female, female thing. Uh, doing push-ups on non-skid at 4 a.m. in the morning in the middle of August in the Persian Gulf is not fun. Gee. But that was part, I was part of, I, I was an initiated chief, not a not the new transition. It's changed a lot. Okay. I was going to say, you did your, I, your initiation with Monterey? I did my initiation with Monterey and with the Kennedy. And so I did it with two different ships. Oh. So I was with the Desron. And trying to do PQS for ESWAS on multiple ships. You know, I was like, and learning all this stuff. And how to make coffee. And this is a funny sea story. So, do you drink coffee? I do. Every day. Every day. Hard, hard drinking coffee? What do you mean hard? Like, like you can't live without it? I can't live without caffeine. There you go. Okay. So. <laughs> I mean, I can, but I'll have a headache. Okay. So remember I said, where did I grow up and where's my family from? London, England. Okay. And also I have family up in Manchester and Brighton. But coffee never, you know, in the 1960s, 1970s, coffee never came out except for when the Yanks came to visit because everybody drinks tea. So that's what I grew up on. Even in San Francisco, we drink tea. Okay. I couldn't stay. I, I mean, I can remember like two times in England where they would make coffee because I was the, you know, the Yank or something like that. And I'd be like, Oh God, I got it. And being nice, you know, I like toughed through it with like, you know, as much sugar as I could tolerate without being on a sugar high on top of it. Cause I couldn't stand, I couldn't stand the taste of coffee. So I only drank tea and everybody knew this. And so here I am out on the USS Monterey as a chief select with the old fashioned hundred cup percolators in the mess on board ships. I know now they got Keurigs and Starbucks everywhere. And I have to make coffee as a chief select in the chief's mess. And I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, and I, and I tried telling one of the other chief selects who was part of the ship's component. I was like, I don't know how to make coffee. Oh, you've got to be kidding. And they're like, they're like, you know, they're going to make you do it because you're the female. And so sure enough, first set, second morning, first, second morning, I have to make coffee. Well, I totally botched that thing up because there's no instructions because everybody just assumes you know how to make coffee in a hundred cup percolator. 
it was terrible. It was like the weakest thing apparently possible. I, I mean, what do I know about coffee? And then of course they got their little, you know, routine of you got to put it in their cup and stir it with a spoon three times counterclockwise, one time clockwise and clean the, the handle. I'm like, oh my God, totally terrible coffee. So then it's like, and I paid dearly for it. So then the next day, next morning after PT, and there I am at now like 5.30, making it again. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I better put more in. Well, of course, now I put way too much in. And of course, Chiefs like their coffee like tar where the spoon could stand up and it was like, literally, you could have put a ladle in this thing and it would have stood up. It was that bad. Oh my God. And then they, there I am in the Chiefs mess with all these you know, seasoned chiefs and all, and they just, you know, ripping me up and down. And then finally the last one, the master chief of the ship, he just looks at everybody. He says, do not even let her near the percolator. Don't let her near it to make coffee as long as she is on this ship. And then he's like, I can't believe you've made it this far in your career. I said, never had to make it. What can I say? I don't drink it. I don't make it. So that was like one of my funniest things in life. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. <laughs> what was your feeling when you completed the initiation? Because I know you can't talk about all the things that you do during it. You can't talk well, see, about what's in the box. See, there's the, yeah, yeah, in the, oh my God, with Freddie the fish as my pillow in the coffin of ice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> It was like the longest night, you know, there's like no, and, and I'm, and I have to be honest with something is that I'm old school initiation, the old, you can't even consider doing what they used to do nowadays. But, but I have to say that if I hadn't gone through that, I really wonder if I would have made it through the training with Naval Special Warfare to be part of that detachment with SEAL Team 7. I mean, what I had to go through in the training, you know, cause I was like, you're gonna do what to me? You're gonna do what? You know, I look at the people that go through NIAC, which is Navy individual augmentee combat training held up in uh, South Carolina. And I had to go through that once to go to Djibouti, which I thought was kind of a laugh. Sorry, Navy, it's a waste of money. <laughs> and I put that on my critique, two pages I wrote out. Because what NSW put you through is the real life, real deal things gonna happen. We don't mess around. This is what can happen. And because I had gone through real life, hard chief initiation training where you're sleep deprived. Okay, NSW is like, if we go on a mission, we might be awake for 17 hours, you know? We might be freezing cold. We might have to do this. We might have to do that. My chief initiation training is what really helped me to make it through my tour with SEAL Team 7. And I even told them that. And then, what, five, six years later, they send me that NIAC thing, which was like going to kindergarten. And uh, I, I mean, I wrote a two, on the critique answer sheet was one page. I wrote on the full page on the back, and then I got another piece of paper and I wrote it out. And then the next thing I know, I was in the captain's office, the CO's office. And it turned out the CO was a SEAL. And I, I was kind of like, I even said to him, I go, how did you end up getting stuck here? He goes, needs of the Navy, this is my IA tour. And he says, I am so glad you wrote out exactly what you wrote out. Cause I wrote out instances. I actually got injured at NIAC for, for no apparent reason. I got injured and I even told him that. And he said, yeah. And he, and he goes, you're right. And he goes, but I have to bite my lip. And he goes, I'm glad that I can talk to you because you know what it's like. You know the real deal. And I said, yeah. I said, this is ridiculous. And I said, if these people have to go into combat, I said, I don't know what this is going to do. I, I, I was honest, you know. Yeah. But nobody showed me the door and, you know, I get that retirement check every month. So, you know, but like I said, you got you to gotta ask the questions. And you got to speak up when something's not right because lives are always at stake. And it's the person to your left, the person to your right, you're their person to your left and their person to your right. Lives are at stake. 
It's always better to be carried by, you know, you don't want to be the one to be carried by six. You'd rather be tried by 12. It's the best way to look at it. Another um, follow-up question regarding becoming a chief, eventually a senior chief, eventually master chief. How did it feel or did you notice a change of the way people looked up to you or they interacted with you once you got those anchors <laughs> and those stars? Like, did everything completely change? It didn't really change when I made senior chief. When I got that first star, I was like, wow, this is like way cool. I mean, every, I'm gonna be honest, every day since I put that anchor on and I get dressed in the morning and I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I see those anchors, whether they were on my collar or they were on the lapel on the front of my blouse, I would go, this is way cool. I mean, California, way cool. Yeah, way cool. And it didn't matter whether there was just an anchor, a star above it, or two stars above it. It is way cool because it just means something, you know, it's something that you try to achieve. You know, let, let's look at the percentage of 6% make chief, 3% make senior, 1.5% make master chief, and half percent make command master chief. So every time I went up a step, it was like, oh man, this is like way cool. I can't believe, I can't believe that they're, I, this has happened. I can't believe they're paying me to do this. I can't believe they're giving me these adventures and opportunities. I mean, I can't believe that in September of 2017, I got to go to Kazakhstan and represent Fifth Fleet because the senior, the, the force master chief at the time in September of 2017, was Force Master Chief Marshal James Honey, who is going to be our 16th MCPON come September of this year, which is the best. I think he's an awesome person. But he was busy with other engagements, and he asked the he asked the Command Master Chiefs he needed someone to go to Kazakhstan to represent at this two-week engagement thing. And I actually said, I go, I told him, I said, Jim, I said. I'll go. I said, I'm, you know, probably the most junior person in the room here. I said, I'll go if nobody else wants to go. I said, but it's a great opportunity. The World's Fair was being held. There was some senior enlisted conference with all these stand countries, as we call them. And I said, but I understand being the only female in the room that if it's not acceptable to send me, I, I fully understand it. And he was like, oh, he goes, he goes, well, first off, you're the first one that's actually volunteered to go. I go, oh, okay. Well, like about five days later, <laughs> he sends me the email. He says, you're the first and the only one. I go, he goes, you're going to Kazakhstan. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So, you know, I started like Googling and researching on Kazakhstan. <laughs> what did I know about Kazakhstan? I knew about the other stands, but this is the well-developed one where, you know, the, we send the astronauts up and, you know, they come down and SpaceX and all that. I'm like, okay, so I went and a great opportunity. And it was so funny because I came back and he said, how'd it go? And I said, it's like they had never seen a female in a leadership position. And I said, there were two like secretaries who followed me around. I felt like I was some rock star with groupies. I said, these two females were the nicest ladies possible. And I said, they just couldn't believe that there was actually a female in the leadership position in the world. I said, they had never seen a female. I was like in a leadership. I was like, oh my God. So anyway, so, so yeah, you just never know. I mean, you know, raise your hand, ask those questions. What um, what would you say the best part of your service is? The best part? If you had to narrow it down to one moment, one aspect, one thing that really, is it putting on chief? I'm gonna say the best part, um, was bringing Captain Spiker home. You know, it's still, out of everything that happened over 30 years, 
the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent. That would be my highlight moment because it filled the void and we were looking out for somebody and we never gave up. So to me, that is probably like the highlight of my Navy career. That's probably the best thing. And then if you were to say, well, that's a, a rare, unique thing that happened in your Navy career, in your life, being in that spot, and I go, yeah. If that, if that never happened and you asked me that question, I'm gonna tell you that the best thing I could say is that I was there to help train, lead, and make the people behind me and the junior sailors, airmen, marines, space guardians, uh, understand and know their mission and that I did everything I could to make them ready to go out for the mission. That I, and I was known also, if when I was also a training, I was, I'm a master training specialist. So I did a lot of training, uh, <laughs> some whether I wanted it or not. Um, I was also known that if there were people like in a classroom, whether it was gathered around a conference table or in an auditorium of say 20 or 30 people, and I could tell that there was a couple people that weren't really getting it, or you can kind of just start telling by their facial looks and their body language, like either they're bored to death or they're totally clueless as to what's going on and what's being presented. I would, at the end of like a session, I would have them like stay back and I would talk to them sitting eye to eye levels around a table or in chairs. And I would say, okay, like, tell me something that you got out of this or tell me something you are totally lost in this. And I would do that and that was part of what I got known as because I wanted to make certain that they understood it. And they were like, you're really, you're a master chief. You're really taking time to do this. I said, look, this is what my job is. I wanna make certain you understand this because when I sign off on something, I'm saying you're fully capable and ready. You're the best fully qualified person to go do whatever it is, whether it's to go work on a watch floor or to go get on a ship to go somewhere or to go get on that plane and go down to Somalia or Rwanda or Camp Simba. I mean, you know, we could never could have expected what happened in January 6th, 2020 in Camp Simba. I mean, for all of my trips I took there while in Djibouti, when Boko Haram came through and just blasted through that place. I mean, if those people weren't skilled and ready to defend it, you know, it could have been a lot worse. True, we lost three Americans. We could have lost a whole lot more, a whole lot more. But you, you, it's wearing the anchor means that I take the responsibility that all the junior people, or maybe there's senior people with anchors on that just never went through the class or the officers, that they understand what, what their responsibilities are and what has to be done when it needs to be done. And it's not this, oh, I got a card to throw up of a pause, I need a timeout, or, oh, let me go ask somebody. No, somebody's shooting at you. You need to know what to do. Or, you know, the computer line broke, or the orange cable snapped, or whatever. You need to know what to do. That's your job. Yeah. <laughs> You're nodding your head like you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And I promise that I never, ever took a wrench and hit anybody on the head saying, you gotta know this. <laughs> that wasn't my philosophy. <laughs> With um, such a lengthy career, um, one that bounces back between Tampa, Middle East, Guam, and <laughs> many, many TAD shipboard yeah. activities and all these things, um, are there any friendships that you continue after? Oh service? yeah, yeah, both to, to both officer those. and enlisted, yeah. Like I said, when I when I found out that Jim Honey was going to be selected as the new as the 16th McPon man, I sent him an email and a text message, and he responded the next day. I mean, this is a man that 
probably got hundreds and hundreds of you know congratulations but he responded and wrote out to everybody I, I mean him Terry Scott who was the Mick Pond when I made chief at, and he was out at Fifth Fleet at the time he and I still email or text message every so often um, there's officers that I keep in contact with that longs they're now they're all retired now you know friendships that I, I mean it's it's like networking I mean I feel like I have the networking of if I want to go somewhere and stay with someone I can just say hey I'll be in this area you know do you mind can I you know crash for a couple days and I do the same with people coming up down here to Venice Shark's Tooth capital of the world you know hit the beaches you know stuff like that so yeah I've really made a lot of friends um, my daughter when she was commissioned into the Air Force uh, she actually had a very good friend of our family friend of ours he's a retired Navy captain she graduated from Embry-Riddle Aer Aeronautical and she was in the ROTC program there and uh, she had him do her commissioning and he calls her his Air Force daughter stays in touch with her he's been retired for what got 10-12 years now probably uh, stays in touch with her, sees her when he's up in the D.C. area because he has family up there and she's up at NGA. Um, yeah, there, there's just a lot of people worldwide that I stay in touch with. I mean, I, in fact, I've been invited to go to a wedding in Guam next month, but I don't think I'm going to go because when I opened the invitation, no plane ticket fell out. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was nice. I mean, it was from one of my one of my reservists out there. I was like, wow. But like I said, no plane ticket fell out of the invite, so kind of putting that one on hold. <laughs> Did you uh, join any organizations when you got out, like any veteran organizations? Well, I was already a VFW member because I got caught up about, I don't know, like 15 years ago overseas. They were doing a big VFW overseas uh, campaign with all of the people um, assigned in the Middle East and the Far East and all that. So I had actually totally forgotten that I was a VFW member until I was trying to get help with my VA claim. So I said, oh, VFW. So I go to the VFW on Venice Avenue and I had this old, really ratty looking paper card in my wallet from like 15 years ago. And the guy pulls it up and goes in the computer and he goes, you know, you're a life member. And I go, oh, I guess I did pay like the 200 or 300 bucks, you know, I was like, oh, okay. So they helped me out, but they were the ones sent me to the guy who ended up leaving and, but I got it figured out with the VA claim. Yes. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I joined the, the VFW. I mean, I'm a, obviously I'm a member of many chiefs mess around the world that I paid lifetime memberships for. So I guess I can show up at any place and uh, have a beer for like 75 cents, something like that. <laughs> or maybe watch people drink coffee because I'll be drinking tea. <laughs> uh, what other org? Oh, I know one other organization. Um, I've kept this kind of like on the down low in my life with the Navy. So I guess I can bring it up now is, um, I'm a big, I've always been involved in relay for life wherever I am. So one of the things, you know, life happens. So in 1988, while we were still in Spain, before I had joined the Navy, I was a family member. Um, I had developed uh, a lump in my neck, which everybody kept putting off. And when we got to the States, um, it turned out when I went to see a doctor in the States in Memphis, we were at Memphis at the time, um, I ended up having uh, thyroid cancer and I had it removed in 1988. And. Uh, it was September of 1988, and of course, at the hospital at Millington, I'm hearing all the chief selects going through initiation, and all. I was like, God, you know, I really wished I had gone through in 77, joined the Navy, blah, blah, blah. My, you know, you have these melancholy moments because you are just got done facing death and all, and I got tubes hanging out of me and everything. And I was like, huh, eh, maybe one day. No, not going to happen. Well, then in 1990, before the Iraq invasion. This was really weird. I called up a recruiter and the guy was like, yeah, come on in. The reserves will take you. I said, even with the medical? Oh yeah, don't worry about it. I'm like, 
It's not been five years. Ah, you passed everything. You got your overseas screening with the Navy. Ah, it'll work. Okay, so the next thing you know, that's how I ended up joining the Navy. So I kind of, whenever like things came up for like about 20 years of my, 20 and 30 years of my Navy career, you know, they would say, you know, any issues, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, I'm fine, you know. And, but I always was involved in Relay for Life for the cancer support. I, I did that and they were like, wow. And I said, well, there's a couple people in the family have had cancer and all that because I never wanted to draw attention to myself because I did learn that at commands when they say, oh, you know, such and such has this issue or that disease, even though you're fully qualified to be overseas, they still kind of look at you differently. So um, that's another organization that I'm a big one of. And then when people started finding out that I'd had it, you know, the first thing was, it was ironic, I was with the SEAL team and one of the SEALs, he, we were doing a lot of our training out in Ambar, and it was how to do IV support, which I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, we all have to practice putting an IV in each other. And I'm like, what? And he's like, come on, you can do this. I'm like, okay. Well, then he looked down and he saw my neck and he goes, you have, you've, you've already had neck surgery. You've already been cracked. And I go, well, yeah, kind of. And he goes, you can barely tell because Luckily for me, my cancer surgeon had done a specialty in plastic surgery, so he did it right in the line of the neck. And he goes, yeah, most people have a Frankenstein scar on their neck. And he's like, wow, that's really something. And he goes, my mom's looks terrible. And I said, oh, I said, can we keep this between ourselves? He goes, yeah, he goes, we'll keep it between ourselves. I, okay. And uh, he goes, no issues? I said, no issues. How long ago? And I go, 21 years ago. And he goes, yeah, no issues. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, so I, so I do that. Um, when my kids were at Venice High School, I was always involved with the JROTC group, the camping trips. My daughter was in the band. My son was in the science clubs. Um, so I did, you know, the usual stuff as a parent when I was home. And then overseas in Bahrain, I did a lot of volunteering at the Dodd School. Um, the Einstein Hour every Wednesday afternoon, just for something different to do. Uh, a lot of Arab kids, their parents paid to go there. Um, I never saw so many foreign students. There were Arab students, there were kids from India. Um, these kids wanted to learn, they, and they're learning about America, which was even more interesting. They're learning about the 49ers in California, not the 49ers football team. You know, they were like, I don't understand this gold rush thing. Don't you just go to the souk and you buy gold? No, you pan gold, you know, and luckily I was from California, so I kind of explain it. Then I had to explain, I remember one time, about the missions because they had to learn the same curriculum as the American students. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I'm teaching Muslim kids about the missions and why there's 26 missions and they started in San Diego and they went all the way up to San Francisco and why they're spaced apart. And I was like, oh my God, you know, and I'm just going, God, please don't let me get, you know, called to somebody's office for proselytizing somebody. I was like, I, I was just like waiting for that one, yeah. but it never happened, thank God. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of different groups that have been out there, so a lot of different fun things. And diving, I love skin diving. I have to get back into it. Once my neck back and my bones will allow it, I will be back because I'm a master open water diver. I love diving. And you can do it all year around here. I know. That's why we live here. <laughs> when you retired, did you find it difficult readjusting to everyday civilian life? I didn't know what to do because it was right. I mean, I made the decision with COVID. I got a family member that I know is not going to make it much longer. My daughter, my Air Force daughter, was pregnant and the new the new baby was due in March. I was like, oh my God. Well, the baby actually was due on St. Patrick's Day and she decided to show up on February 29th. So we have a leap year baby in the family. And uh, it was like, I didn't know what to do because every it was like things outside of my realm were dictating what I was gonna do from chemo and doctors and 
my aunt, you know, who was also not doing that very well because, she, well, she just passed away in November at 99. So, you know, it was all, it was like all these people were like dictating what I was going to do, except I suddenly wasn't in uniform today. And the world was going crazy. And I was like, I need to go to work. You know, I don't, you know, I, I ran out of terminal leave and now I'm like trying to get my retirement and Millington's not talking and I'm trying to get doctor's appointments for me and nobody's doing that. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like crazy. And so it's kind of been like, my life really hasn't settled down until about this past November, December, I'm going to say. And in January, this past January, I went on a cruise out of Tampa because in 2019, a group of us from the Navy Reserve out of Tampa, we were going to go on a cruise to Cuba, all paid for. I had my leave all set. I was actually at the E7 board, the chief's board in Millington for the month. And then I was going to come home and we were going to go on the cruise right out of Tampa. I was like, yay, looking forward to this. And while I was at the board, the chief's board at Millington, President Trump decided that we weren't going to Cuba. <laughs> I was 10 days to going to Cuba. Within 10 days, I was going to be there. So the cruise line said you can get a refund or you can roll the credit forward. So we rolled the credit forward. And then, of course, obviously, by June of 2020, there was no cruising. And then June of 2021, we're still not cruising. Rolls it forward to June of 2022. And then they opened up cruising. And I talked by this time out of like six people, we're down to two. And I was one of the two. And it was like I talked to my friend and I was like, I want to go. I said, after everything that's happened, I've done with so many, you know, Don's passing, my aunt's passing, dealing with, I'm trustee of their estates. I'm still dealing with this and my VA. I said, I want to go on a cruise. And he's like, well, like where? And I go, I'll find one. But I said, our credit is up in June of 2020, 2022, this coming last month. And he goes, yeah. And I go, we either get our money back or we take a cruise. And I said, I'm not going on a cruise with all the kids out of school for summer. He goes, oh God, I never even thought about that. I said, I did. So in January, we took a cruise and we did the Panama Canal. I'd never done that. That was awesome. Nice. I had never done that. And I was like, that. I was like, whoa, this is cool. I was out on deck sunburn starting at seven o'clock in the morning, going through the locks and then going back. <laughs> Yep, forgot to put the sunblock on the first time out on the deck. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't really until like this past January that I've really kind of gotten more in control of my life. And so like, what am I going to do? Well, one, I got the VA resolved, finally got all my retirement checks resolved. And then I got certified to be a JROTC instructor for the Navy at high schools. And then I got an offer, but it was over by Orlando. And I told the officer, I said, thank you for the offer, but my moving boxes are retired. I'm, I'm done. I said, there's like four schools in the area around where I live. And I've talked with all of them. If there's an opening, I would be very much interested, but that's about it. So other than that, what do I do? Well, I, I'm still working on the two family members. Um, Don's stuff and my aunt's stuff because I was obviously their one a trustee and one the executor of their wills and everything. Um, I, I highly recommend don't dying during a pandemic <laughs> because you can't get anything done and anything that you do have to get done gets botched up because whoever took the info was on a phone call wearing a mask and you're wearing a mask and they got stuff wrong but so I'm working to get a lot of stuff corrected for those two. But um, other than that, uh, oh, I did. I know. I know one thing that I can say about the Navy. So Don was a P3 flyer for his entire career, and I found out about maybe six months before he passed. I happened to be talking to a P3 Bubba out in Guam, and uh, it was kind of interesting. 
because one of the things Don had always said was, you know, he says, don't stick me in the ground. And uh, I said, okay. I said, do you want me buried at sea? And he goes, yeah. He said, you know, I've never been on a ship. And I go, I know you're like, and I kid you not, I'm talking about AT1 Donald F. Mack air crew, never been on a ship, wouldn't know what in the hell to do. Wouldn't know the difference from the fore and the aft, the forecastle, the bridge. And God forbid, if you ever put him inside a ship, he'd be so lost not knowing how to read the plates. So I did some talking and I found out, I said, does anybody ever get dropped out of an airplane for burial at sea? And the guy, this was an old guy, retired P3 guy I met out in Guam. And he's like, yeah, he says, we used to stick them out of the sauna buoy tubes. I'm like, oh my. So I started doing some research and some, you know, cause I hate to say it, when you're a command master chief, people usually talk to you when you say, hey, I got a question. <laughs> and I was calling Millington and I found out and I found the contact. And uh, so I did tell him that, and he, I was like, would you like to be dropped out of a sauna buoy tube after you're cremated? And he was like, he looked at me, he started crying. He was like, that would make my life. So. We got him dropped out of a sauna buoy tube off VP-30, about 400 miles off the coast of Jacksonville in a trench through a sauna buoy. I got the pictures, so that was kind of a cool thing. So that I call networking with the Command Master Chiefs and the anchor. The power of the anchor. A lot of people will never realize the power of the anchor. So that was kind of cool. So. He's in the sea, my aunt's in the wall at Point Loma with my uncle, who survived World War II and two plane crashes, and everybody's where they're supposed to be. <laughs> That's the way I'm looking at it now. And when I was at Point Loma last month, when we put her in the wall, I stood out on the balcony overlooking, there were two submarines in port. You were a San Diego guy, right? So you know what I'm talking about, overlooking Point Loma. Lucky me, uh, there's two submariners. I looked over towards IP and I could see a SEAL class out working the beach. I was like, I'm up here, they're down there. <laughs> Everyone's where they're supposed to be. Every, that, that's, that is my philosophy after we got her put in the wall is everybody is where they're supposed to be in my family right now. Yeah. So that is life. And my son got to go to Cuba on a mobilization tour in 2020. I was like, you find, I've been dying to go to Cuba and you get to go to Cuba. He goes, well, Gitmo's not really going to Cuba. I said, I know, I know. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> so how do you think your naval career affected the way you relate to other Americans, um, to everyday civilians? That's a toughie, you know that? It's a tough one, I think, in our today's culture, depending upon who you're talking to. So I can give you an example that just happened last week with me. So obviously I'm very patriotic. We give our lives for the cloth, the American flag. A friend of mine got a boat and she got a flag to put on her boat which I felt was very offensive to the American flag. I was really shocked at A, that, you know, this is a friend that they would put something like that on display on their boat. I mean, I, I was expecting an American flag or a uh, American flag with the, thir you know, the 13 stars in the circle. I was like, Lord, let me just put it that way. And, and I made it, and I said something to her and there was a guy there who I, had no idea who this guy was. And um, I was like, I just can't believe that you did this. Now, true, this person with the, who now owns the boat and the flag is, is like half my age. I'm not going to deny that. She's in her early 30s, well, doing very well in her career. Um, you know, so she has every right to do it, but it just kind of like threw me off knowing her father um, and just. I said, I just can't believe that you would put a flag like that up. She goes, well, I want people to know where I am when I'm out on the water. And I said, I said, you couldn't have found something, you know, more personal and not so cutting of our American flag. And then this 
gentleman who I had no idea with, you know, like I said, interacting with your average American person just jumped all over me about she can do whatever she wants and it's just a piece of material, blah, blah, blah. And I said, this piece of material represents a lot, you know, and I started saying a couple things and I said, you know, until you've had to be with a group of coffins that are covered with it or willing to give your life for it, you, you don't understand, you not remember what our country stands for. Oh, it's just a piece of cloth and our country's like crap and blah, blah. oh my God, it was like, I just had to walk away because I'm a very calm, I'm a very patient person, I don't blow up, but I was just like, I've also known for not being the swearing Navy chief, which is a very unusual person, um, <laughs> very unusual, and I, I just, I just, I couldn't believe that this person, the way he was talking, and, and he was still talking, I could hear him, a friend who's probably not a friend now, thinking that it was okay. And then, you know, it's, that's just a recent one, but there's been other ones where like, you know, you hear people, like, you go to Lowe's and, you know, a lot of people know me there because I've done a lot of home projects like everyone else has the last year and a half being crammed in their homes. And, oh, yeah, you get your 10 percent, you know, and then someone says, oh, I don't know why you're getting this and that. You know, what did you do for that? You know, I have to turn around. I said, well, I, you know, kind of like gave up a few years of my life, like 30, uh, to help defend our country so that you can do what you would like to do, you know, and you're not now, you know, praising God, you know, praising Allah and reading the Quran or reading Japanese or, you know, different things like that. And, um, it, it's, it's, I've noticed that my circle of friends has really gotten smaller. Um, I, part of it is I have very severe tinnitus and hearing loss from things that went boom. So I have a hard time hearing. Um, especially with the tinnitus, and it does give me the anxiety that's developed into PTSD. Um, and because of that, I have a hard time hearing things with groups of people. So I, I've noticed that my circle of friends has gotten smaller, A, because I don't really want to hear some of the, the stuff, the crap, excuse the term, that people say, because I just feel like, where were you? You know, when we were doing what we were doing and you were sitting at home and you were watching Netflix and going to the beach and going on vacations and having a great life. And then I gave up a lot of my time and my life and my children's life and their, you know, being involved in it. And yet you're giving me a hard time about this. So I don't really need to hear you. And then the other is I can't hear if I'm in large groups because it's just so much noise and cacophony, I call it. Um, so I have noticed my interactions with people, um, it's a twofold as to how my circle, my social circle has gotten smaller um, in the last, really just over the two years that I've been back home, um, when now that we go out and we do social things and all that. And, and, and it's, it's kind of ironic is I'm, I'm actually becoming okay with it because it's like, I don't want to like give up unnecessary energy of, of me to try to talk and explain or say, well, you should think about it from this side or can we just talk or we used to be able to do this and that. So, but I'm okay with that. It's, you know, it's like, I can't, I'm not going to change the world. I'm not going to change people's outlook and philosophy that have no ideas to what I've been through. Yeah. How has your military experience um, affected the way you look at, uh, like, war? So having someone who has been in a war, there's a war going on in Europe and... Yeah, the Ukraine the And the Ukraine war is really... Um, when we lived in Spain in the 80s, I actually, actually... I'm probably one of the few people with a clearance of my level um, I've been to Russia and I spent a month in Ukraine in 1986 on a USO vacation tour. Um, so it is really hard to see what's going on in Ukraine. And it's also hard because I have two children that are in the military. Um, you know, like to know that they could be in harm's way. And I'm probably, I'm probably the different kind of mother because 
when, you know, I have a great relationship with both of my children who are now adults, which I love because we go on trips, we meet up on vacations, we have great get togethers, you know, we have the, you know, we've gone from the parent child relationship to the parent parent because they're parents, I'm parent, adult adult, which is really a great thing. But we also have the military to military. And I probably do just because I am their parent, even though we are all adults, I do always ask them, do you feel confident? Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel ready? Things like that, you know, and they're like, oh, come on, mom, you know, you know, don't be the master chief. And I said, well, I do. I, I, I worry that, you know, I look at you guys, I look at the, I look at younger people nowadays, who are going into the service, I get worried that we are offering $25,000 bonuses for people just to join the Navy to go to boot camp right now. That scares the bejesus out of me. Are, are we that like short on people or slim on, you know, manpower that we have to offer them $25,000 on top of the $2,000 just for them to pass their PT to get out of boot camp that you have to pass to get out in the first place. <laughs> you know, I, I do worry about that. I, I worry about where we're at in the war. I, I, I feel like our military forces, I don't think we have the manpower and strength that we should have. When I think about all of the bases that China is building right now all along East Africa that I watched being built when I was at CJTF HOA, I watched three bases being built. I watched them rebuild the whole East Africa railroad system by bringing in the Chinese laborers. You can't go a block in Ethiopia without hitting a Chinese food restaurant. You want Chinese food in Africa, you go to Ethiopia. <laughs> Great Chinese food there. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like I, I worry about that when I when I see that in the buildup, you know, as to how are we ready if something happens. Yeah. You know. Is there any um, messages or anything like that that you want future generations or other people to take away from your story? Yeah, it's that you know. We, we learn from the past to go forward in the future. And we don't want to have history repeating itself. And it's, it's very disheartening, you know, when I hear about, oh, we're getting rid of this statue, or we're renaming this base, or we're getting rid of this book, or we're getting rid of this, some file or something. And it's like, okay, so we get rid of it. And in two generations, nobody knows or remembers or is around as to why we got rid of something and then it re reappears because people think oh there's nothing to go by and you know i just really i just really fear that going forward in the future for my grandchildren especially i really do kind of feel because they're going to be this they're going to be that second generation of being two generations ahead right now of not knowing and not not understanding a lot of things and I and I really do worry about our, our I worry about our country I worry about our government I worry about the way things are I feel like we're I feel like we have way too much is being put out on media than should be and it's and it goes back to our last wars that we've been in has been a total social media war because everybody knew what was happening when it happened it was no more Walter Cronkite or Edward Murrow on the six o'clock news and they're showing a four-day-old newsreel that was sent out of Vietnam or Korea. And we're and they're telling us what we need to know, not everything. You know, there's always that saying saying of, I'm gonna tell you what you need to know, not what you want to know. And I feel like nowadays everybody knows everything, and the problem is they don't know what part of it is the need to know. So, yeah. Is there anything you wish people knew more about veterans? <laughs> yeah, I, I wish that I wish that they would understand more that every veteran is different. Every veteran tells a story. Every veteran, regardless of age, sex, time and service, 
um, tells a different story. And, uh, you know, we felt the need to do what needed to be done. Uh, you know, I wish they would be a little bit more appreciative. You know, I want to thank Lowe's for giving us that veteran's parking spot. I think that's awesome. I wish, you know, I mean, I... And it's, and it's ironic is that I have been challenged numerous times, although on my Hyundai Santa Fe, my license plate frame says, you know, Master Chief U.S. Navy on it. And I do keep a ball cap on the front dash <laughs> because people see me and they go, oh, you can't, can't be a Master Chief. And, 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 and it's, and it's just nice, you know, it's like, you know, they need, more people need to remember why we're here. I mean, Civil rights is awesome in America. We wouldn't be where we are without civil rights. But at the same time, which is more important? The fact that we named a bridge for somebody or we named a statue for somebody or we named a, a day off for somebody or is it more important to the people that, oh, we saved the borders of our country so that we're still America. Because you know what, those statues, those books, those declarations, those days off wouldn't mean anything if we don't have our borders, so. And you're not gonna have those borders without having veterans. No. Well, thank you very much, Deborah, for participating in the Veterans History Project. Um, I will turn okay. it to you for the final word. Well, I just wanna say thank you. Um, I'm really glad I had this opportunity that in one of uh, my congressman's Sunday email blasts that he sends out uh, that I do read. It may not be early Sunday. It might be Monday sometimes. Um, you know, I take the time and I saw the thing for the opportunity for the veterans uh, history thing. And I think it's important that everybody knows because unfortunately, you know, our World War II veterans, there's not many left. So that means we're now running out of Korean veterans. And next it'll be Vietnam. And then it'll be our invasions that took place in the 80s. And then we're up to the Gulf War. So, you know, time goes very fast, whether people realize it or not. So that's all. Thank you very much. All right.